Thank you. At the, at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Namrata Sharma for having me in this uh, wonderful instruction course. Uh, I'll be discussing with you about Acanthamoeba keratitis, which is fortunately not very common because if it's there, then it can have a devastating uh, outcome. Uh, there are various risk factors, but majority what we feel and majority that have been reported are contact lens users. And if they don't maintain contact lens properly, if they don't uh, clean it properly, if they have uh, slept with contact lens, if they have done swimming with contact lens use, usage, all these factors, or if there is a contamination, trauma and contamination with brackish water, these factors can lead to uh, acanthamoeba keratitis. Orthokeratology uh, also has been incriminated, but mostly people who use tap water. Uh, for cleaning the lens, they found out to be having these uh, acanthamoeba keratitis. And there was a survey done uh, in UK, in London, uh, regarding the presence of acanthamoeba in tap water. And they found out that 80% of the samples of London itself had acanthamoeba in that. So we can imagine that in India we definitely will have that. So improperly managing, managed contact lens usage is one factor that can lead to canthamoeba keratitis. Mostly it's unilateral. The, it is classically, you know, having uh, severe pain basically because of keratoneuritis except in immunocompromised uh, patients like HIV patients or advanced diabetic patients, they may have a silent acanthamoeba keratitis as well, which is not very painful. And most of the times, we usually in any coronal ulcer, when the patient comes to us, sometimes we, we may not get the pathognomonic sign and then we start treating the patient with antibacterials and other medications and then when nothing works, then we start thinking about acanthamoeba. So this is how many times it is diagnosed. Uh, typically the symptoms are same as any other corneal ulcer, only thing is that the pain is quite severe and on examination, in, if you are lucky enough to get the patient in an early phase, then you will have epithelial granularity, that is the earliest sign that is seen and then uh, the patient can have uh, pseudodendrites. Why, what I meant by pseudodendrites is that in herpetic keratitis you have true dendrites, wherein you have a terminal bulbs, here the dendrites have a tapering ends and that is why it's called pseudodendrites. As the disease progresses, you have patchy stromal infiltrates or the perineural infiltrates radially seen. Uh, however, this is, pa this is pathognomonic, but uh, many times you get to see patients when it is quite advanced with a ring ulcer, a classical ring ulcer, as you can see here in this case, which further progresses, causes stromal thinning, lysis, and perforation, and, uh, uh, and hence. Uh, uh, leading to a uh, serious outcome. Now this is an example of a ring infiltrate seen in an early phase of acanthamoeba keratitis, not that late as I had shown in the earlier photograph. And, uh, on exa and uh, normally what happens is that you can have ring infiltrate even in pseudomonas keratitis, but in pseudomonas the progression is very fast, but in acanthamoeba the progression is not that fast. and. Uh, uh, and then uh, the inflammation may be seen a little later, not that severe, but there can be presence of scleritis in these cases and then you can have some neovascularization in the periphery as seen in this case. You can have typical scleral nodules leading to atrophy and mostly you have these uh, Mostly you have these, uh, uh, you know, fleeting nodules. You can see nodules at one point, then there is scleral thinning, and then you can see the nodules on the other side also, and then again there is a thinning. And in this particular case, it is an example wherein we had a 360 degree scleral thinning uh, because of this scleritis along with acanthamoeba keratitis. Diagnosis can be made uh, clinically uh, as well as by microbiological uh, evaluation. And uh, corneal scraping can be sent. You can send the contact lens, divide it into pieces and send it for other things as well as for acanthamoeba. You can send the contact lens solution. That can also aid in diagnosis. You can do confocal microscopy, biopsy and PCR. Now, in confocal microscopy, uh, we start from uh, the level of endothelium and we come forward. Now, as we come forward, we get to see these uh, thickened nerves and... Uh, see the thickened nerves are seen, these are inflamed nerves and that is the reason for the uh, perineural infiltrate and severe pain. Then double walled cyst you can see here, 
these are the double walled cysts and then refractile trophozoite seen at the basal epithelium of the uh, cornea and uh, the cysts they stay nicely with calcofluor white and this is the uh, apple green, green fluorescence seen with calcofluor white. On culture, it is done on non-nutrient agar with uh, live or killed gram-negative bacilli. And normally what you see that in a single plate, if you send, uh, put the scraping, you will, have, you will see depressions which are called trails. But these depressions can be seen uh, in the presence of simple macrophages as well. So it is always advisable once you see the depression and trails, then there should be a serial transfer of uh, this because these macrophages, they, they uh, degenerate after that, but the acanthibiba doesn't degenerate. And on serial transfer, you will have again trails or depressions in the next plate, and then you uh, are uh, absolutely sure that this is acanthamoeba. Real-time PCR is very sensitive and uh, it gives you a fast diagnosis. Now, as far as treatment is concerned, we start with uh, a combination therapy of polyhexamethylene uh, bigonide and propamidine, uh, PHMB 0.02% and propamidine 0.1% eye drops. And PHMB normally is not available uh, commercially. Propamidine is also not freely available, so there are very few uh, places where you get it. Now, for PHMB, you need to have an association with a pharmacy. You, you get these 20% uh, 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 vials wherein you have 20 ml solution. You have to use the laminar flow under which you can, these 20% solution can be converted into 0.02% by adding normal saline. So, or you can have a, uh, a connection with a pharmacy. That, that's what we have at RP Center. We have a pharmacy and, and uh, we get it from there. Now, if these drugs are not available or if uh, you can't do it, you can use azoles as well for treatment of uh, acanthaeba keratitis. Now, miltifosin is one drug which has come up uh, recently. It is an anti-leishmania drug. And uh, because uh, of uh, its uh, good impact, good effect, uh, the animal studies have shown good results. And now it is available commercially as well. In India also it's available. Uh, Zydus Cadilla have this uh, Impavido 50 milligram uh, capsules, which can be used uh, three times a day if uh, uh, somebody is more than 45 uh, kg weight, less than 45 kg weight, it can be given twice a day for uh, good results and it has been shown to be quite effective in both uh, animal model as well as in humans. Steroid is useful if there is inflammation and there are many cases wherein you do have inflammation but it has to be given under bigonite cover. You can have anterior scleritis, you can have uh, these uh, uh, you know, fleeting nodules onto the sclera. And then uh, you start steroid, you see that whether the, the effect is there or not. Once the effect is there, you taper it off gradually. Sometimes it takes a lot of time for this scleritis to heal. Or if you have a scleritis, something like this, which is, you know, forming nodule and causing atrophy and not responding to these, then you have to give uh, even pulse steroid or you can. Uh, mycophenolate is one drug which is preferred in these cases. Quite effective and safe. However, the Mycophenolate should be initiated with a 500 milligram OD dose. Then gradually over a period of four or five days, you increase it to 500 milligram twice a day and then further increase to 500 milligram three times a day. So uh, you can increase it up to 1.5 uh, gram and then as there is uh, the impact effect is there, then you can uh, uh, remove it. Cyclosporine again is uh, quite an effective drug. Uh, I have a good experience with mycophenolate, uh, so that's why I would emphasize on mycophenolate uh, because it has a good impact on uh, treatment of scleritis. Supportive therapy is very useful in acanthaeba because these patients have a lot of pain and many have inflammation, so cycloplegic, anti-glaucoma medications, these should be given. Lubricants should be given only once the effect of the anti-acanthaeba drug uh, starts coming in order to reduce the toxicity of the drug. Initially, we should not give it because it will dilute the uh, anti acanthamoeba drug. Pain relief is one thing which we should definitely, you know, we should inquire the patient about how much pain the patient is having. Many times we tend to forget, we give uh, definitive therapy, we forget to uh, give pain relief. And 
uh, I have a few patients in whom I had to uh, use lignocaine patch in order to uh, get the relief of uh, pain in acanthobacteritis with scleritis. So the, the example that I was showing, uh, that was one example wherein I had used lignocaine patch. There are a couple of other examples wherein I had to use. So NSAIDs, if they are effective, it's fine. If it doesn't work, you can use opioids like tramadol, etc. If that is not working, then you have to use these lignocaine patches. CXL and PTK have been used in one or two cases. There are case reports. Uh, they have shown some reasonable result, but uh, it uh, cannot be considered as an effective and uh, cannot be considered as an established modality. Uh, penetrating keratoplasty is the last option in acanthia keratitis, and if it's not working, if it's causing perforation, in that case, you have to do a penetrating keratoplasty. If it is not resolving at all, you have to do penetrating keratoplasty. But the idea in uh, in in acanthobacteritis is to to reduce the infective load as much as possible because the recurrence in the graft is very high. So it's always better to reduce the infective load a little bit, and then uh, we can think of doing a keratoplasty in such a case in order to have a good outcome. Thank you very much for your patient listening.